Almost every country in the world today operates its economy through some form of capitalism. Even the few remaining countries that wouldn't clearly fall into the definition of a capitalist economy, and even countries that have built a national identity in opposition to capitalism, have either willingly or begrudgingly adopted a lot of its characteristics. But is this global capitalist hegemony inevitable? Capitalism as it exists today is a relatively new phenomenon as it only really started taking shape with the Industrial Revolution. With that in mind, it's easy to look at the development of capitalism and the development of the global economy over the same time period and conclude that this is just the optimal way of doing things and that through natural selection the ideal economic system was created and spread around the world. Capital development, the motivation for innovation, the drive to work harder and the efficiencies of the free market are all touted as major benefits of capitalism. Benefits which have in turn made our civilizations thousands of times wealthier than they were in the centuries before capitalism. People that oppose capitalism will point to rising inequality, the exploitation of natural resources, and the erosion of human rights in the name of maximising output as equally important drawbacks. Unfortunately, these opposing ideals mean that support or criticism of the predominant economic system in the world is treated less as something to be optimised and more as something to align behind as if capitalism and something like socialism were opposing sports teams where only one side could win. Beyond just not being very productive for real change, this kind of passionate support for one economic system or another is kind of misguided. It really is as silly as say someone like a mechanic picking a hammer as their favourite tool and then trying to fix a car without even considering a socket wrench where it might be the better suited tool for a particular job. So to make sense of capitalism and to hopefully form a more well rounded overview of this economic tool, we need to as always answer a few simple questions. What even is capitalism? There is a good chance that most people passionately debating for or against it don't even get this part right. Why has capitalism become so dominant in our modern global economy? And finally, are there better alternatives? You might not realise how much you actually need to write for your work. I write these scripts for a living, but I was surprised to learn that the majority of working professionals spend as much as 88% of their time communicating, whether it's content for their work or just emails to colleagues and customers. Clearer communication could save you so much of that time, and that's why anyone who's a working professional needs Grammarly, the sponsor of this video. Their AI assistant helps me write better and faster and without compromising my privacy, which allows me to create more videos for you to watch on the channel. And I'm so glad that Grammarly takes privacy seriously and the data that you put in has never and will never be sold to third parties. So I can relax about the possibility of my scripts coming up on other people's AI powered searches. My time spent on emails, my least favourite necessary task, has been cut down massively by using Grammarly's extension that writes polite email replies for me. And this incredible tool for anybody who writes on a regular basis is free to try out. Just sign up using my link at grammarly.com slash economics zero one and download Grammarly for free and speed up your writing tasks now. Okay, so one of the biggest issues in addressing the strengths, weaknesses and subsequent inevitability of capitalism is that unfortunately there is no universally agreed upon definition of capitalism. A big reason for that is simply the tribalism that evolves around economic systems like this where one side will attribute everything good to capitalism and the other side will only attribute bad stuff and in the end, whether intentional or not, it all just gets a bit too messy to put a hard and fast definition on it. That being said, by taking a step back and understanding what capitalism is supposed to achieve, we can get a more well-rounded idea of what it is than honestly most professional economists have. Capitalism, socialism, communism and even anarchy are all systems to try and answer the fundamentally unanswerable problem of economics. We live in a finite world, but as humans we have unlimited desires. So decisions have to be made about what gets produced with those limited resources, how it gets made and who it gets made for. Capitalism tries to deal with this problem by creating incentives for people to make more stuff more efficiently by rewarding those who make the largest contributions with the largest share of resources. Now of course this doesn't always work as well in practice as it sounds in theory, but we'll get to that soon. For now, capitalism is just an economic tool to address the central economic problem, the same way that a socket wrench is a tool to address the problem of a securely fastened nut. Now, the characteristics of the tool of capitalism are where different economists, politicians and even regular people have different ideas, but there are some core features that almost everybody agrees on, but also some that might be surprising. For starters, free markets, free trade and even things like money are by no means unique to capitalism. These all existed well before capitalism did and are still components of other economic systems like socialism because they're so effective at answering some of the central economic questions. Instead of a government or some other entity deciding who gets what based on arbitrary rules, a free market allows people to decide for themselves what they want by spending their money on things that they value the most. This will in turn tell producers what to produce more of and what to produce less of so that the economy more effectively allocates its limited resources towards what people actually want. 
The main feature that distinguishes the particular economic system of capitalism is that free markets exist for the private ownership of capital, hence the name capitalism. Capital by its economic definition is stuff that helps an economy make more stuff. So tools, factories, infrastructure and technology. The development and improvement of capital is what has allowed the world to become as wealthy as it has over the past 250 years since the beginning of the industrial revolution. Things like steam engines, railways, modern production lines and instant communication enable the production and creation of wealth at a level that has never been seen before in the history of humanity. Now the idea of capitalism is that since these tools and technologies can be privately owned, there is an incentive for an economic participant to make improvements on existing capital or invent something totally new and then use that to reap the rewards of the additional wealth they helped create. For those people that don't already have enough resources to tinker on and improve capital, they can seek investors who have excess resources that have not been put to any better use, who can decide if their idea is good enough to invest their resources in, normally for a share of the ownership of the improved capital. Now, in most cases, the resources that investors are putting into new ideas just take the form of money, which is a highly liquid way for resources to be accounted for and transacted in any economy, not necessarily just a capitalist economy. It's worth noting, however, that investment into new capital development doesn't need to just be in the form of money. OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, received billions of dollars in investment from Microsoft, but most of that took the form of Microsoft letting them use their servers to run their AI programs on. In this case, Microsoft, the investor, had additional resources, spare server space, that could be given to a company with a way to improve capital, artificial intelligence technology, and if this technology is used to increase wealth generation, Microsoft will be rewarded for giving those resources with a return on their investment. This system of investment and incentivized innovation makes capitalism not only incredibly efficient at answering the question of what should be produced, but also how it should be produced. Now, this is different from the economic systems that came before it, where capital was mostly just owned by the ruling class and there was little incentive for people to make improvements on tools and technology because they wouldn't be the ones to reap the rewards for it and it was difficult to attract investment in the first place because again, unless a potential investor was a member of the ruling class, they would struggle to get a return on their investment before it was just claimed by some lord whose land it was developed on. That's why property rights, the protection of the ownership that people claim over capital, both physical and intellectual, is another big feature of capitalism. If people are rewarded for improving how much an economy can produce, or at least giving the resources to the people that can improve how much an economy can produce, well then naturally an economy will produce more, which means even average people that aren't investors or innovators will have more wealth and access to more resources than if these incentives didn't exist. Now this is exactly what has happened. Just last month we explored the economy of ancient Rome and found that since the empire didn't have much in the way of capital, like machinery, technology and even infrastructure, the economy didn't produce goods and services on nearly the scale we do today, and most people at the time dedicated most of their effort to just making enough food to eat. People in most countries around the world today, especially advanced economies, enjoy access to more goods and services than even kings from a few hundred years ago, because there is so much more to go around. Now, of course, the benefits of this system have lifted everybody up. Economists call this the rising tide that lifts all boats. But it has lifted some people up a lot further than others, which is only the start of the system's serious problems. Capitalism as a system to encourage the development and utilisation of capital has done a lot of good for the world, but it often goes too far into areas where the ends are not the intention of the means. Obviously some of the most vocal critics of capitalism are people like Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin who called the workers of the world who were left behind to seize the means of production. Now when Marx and Lenin were writing about this, a better translation would have probably been to seize the factors of production because they were not just talking about taking back factories and machinery that was privately owned, they were talking about the other factors of production as well, land and labour. The private ownership of capital incentivizes owners to make that capital as efficient and effective as possible for adding value to the market economy. But something like owning land arguably has far more drawbacks and provides very little of the upside because it's very hard to improve a patch of dirt in the same way that someone could improve a piece of technology. Now, I think it's time to make the big disclaimer here that I am personally someone who owns land to live on and to rent out to other people. So even though it's in my personal best interest to maintain the use of land for economic returns, it does cause some problems. Land is a fundamentally limited factor because unlike a piece of equipment, it can't be created. Well, not really. Expensive land doesn't increase total economic output either, and in many cases over the medium to long term, it can reduce it. If land becomes safer and easier to invest in than capital, it will take money away from developments that will genuinely benefit the entire economy. If an investor could put $1 million into building new farm equipment, or $1 million into just owning a farm, then no matter what the price tag is on the farmland, it's not going to produce any more or any less food just because it's more expensive. 
If that money was spent instead on buying the equipment, then with all other things being equal, it will increase output because something like a combine harvester or better irrigation systems can be used to make more food from existing land. Expensive land also puts pressure on people that would innovate in an economy to not take risks for fear of losing a place to live. The argument in favour of capitalism over any other economic system is that it has proven to be highly effective at maximising total economic output. So even if it does create inequality, there is still more to go around in total. But if it encourages behaviour that could even reduce long term output, well then it's a system that could be improved. This is very close to the ideas of Georgism, a type of capitalism where people can still make money by investing in or creating stuff that makes stuff or just working really hard, but are heavily discouraged from making money by just owning land. This is normally done through very high taxes on the unimproved value of land, and in extreme hypothetical versions of a Georgian capitalist economy, the only tax would be this type of tax, further encouraging the development of enterprise to improve real economic output. Now this probably deserves a video all of its own, and it's unlikely that a land value tax, however steep, would be able to replace all of the other taxes in an economy. Even still, it's a great demonstration of the genuine flaws of capitalism and creative ways that they can be patched. Beyond just the economic idea that this gets more resources dedicated to making even more resources rather than the wealth of a nation being tied up in its literal dirt, there is a pretty compelling moral argument that the land of a country should belong to the people of that country, and if an individual or a business wants the exclusive rights to use that land, they should compensate everybody else for it. So capitalism is great at improving productive output by creating a free market for capital, and at least in its current form, that has had the consequence of also turning land into a speculative asset. But perhaps the biggest critique of capitalism is what it does to the third factor of production, labour. Now in modern advanced economies people cannot directly buy labour, that practice is well, frowned upon these days. But another feature of capitalist economies is that a free market for labour still exists with the job market, where workers can sell their hours and businesses can buy them. Capitalism also offers an incentive here for workers to improve the value of their labour in the same way that it incentivizes innovators, investors and business owners to improve the quality of their capital. If a worker has a master's degree in engineering, they will probably be able to produce more economic value in an hour of work than someone working in a forklift, and that person with a forklift licence will probably be able to move more stuff around a warehouse than someone using their bare hands. The formal and well developed market for specialised jobs means that people have an incentive to acquire skills that will provide the most value to the economy, which in turn means more value is produced for everyone. People are also encouraged to provide labour that they are good at for the same reason. This system is not perfectly efficient by any means, but it is much more effective than some kind of central organisation determining who does what. Before capitalism, people's roles in society were basically just be delegated to them by a ruling class, and since the vast majority of people were labourers and farmers anyway, there wasn't that much of a need to efficiently allocate skilled labour to where it would add the most value. So all in all, this modern system of a free market for labour sounds like a significant improvement, and it is. But again, it's not without its problems. In a capitalist system, the people that own land and capital, two out of the three factors of production, have an incentive to pay the third factor of production, labour, as little as possible, to retain more economic benefits for themselves. Thanks to the strong ownership rights and protections that modern capitalist economies have in place, it's very easy to acquire vast amounts of land and capital. Jeff Bezos doesn't need to raise his own army to defend all of the Amazon warehouses in the world, that's done for him. And since land and capital can be used to make economic returns to acquire even more land and capital, it's very easy for these factors of production to become highly centralised in the hands of a few people. Labour however is fundamentally limited to how much work a single person can do, so it by its very nature is far more spread out across every economic participant in an economy. The problem this causes is that it's much easier to coordinate a small number of huge amounts of land and capital, rather than a vast amount of individual pieces of labour. Workers are economically incentivised to fight against one another for good jobs, whereas businesses are economically incentivised to pay as little as possible. This is where calls for workers, the factor of production that are actual living breathing people, to seize the other factors of production, land and capital, from those who would profit off them by claiming them, and since one of the cornerstones of capitalism is protection of land and capital ownership, such drastic actions would be a rejection of the capitalist system in its entirety. Now, in reality, capitalism is a very efficient tool that has undeniably done some amazing good for the world. The wealth that we all enjoy today, even though it may not always seem like it compared to millionaires and billionaires, is still far better than toiling in fields. Rewarding the development of tools, technologies and skills to build our modern economies has been a great success of capitalism, but that doesn't mean it's perfect or inevitable. Capitalism is an economic tool that provides and answers the central economic questions and makes them easier to address by having more resources to share around. Answering what to produce is a much nicer question to deal with when it's a decision between electric cars or petrol cars, it's not quite as nice when it's making the decision between producing enough food and producing enough medicine. 
Capitalism is not evil, nor is it some virtuous gift that has blessed mankind. Just like a hammer is not evil or good by itself. It's a tool that can be very useful if used right and do a lot of damage if it's used wrong. Capitalism, like any tool, can also be improved and modified. Already, every economy in the world today has laws and regulations to rein in markets from being truly free, and there is a potential to keep the best parts of a system while addressing its serious shortcomings, which will hopefully lead to a better quality of life for all economic participants. Now, with hopefully a better understanding of what capitalism is, we made a video a few months ago but put into action in one of the clearest examples of capitalism versus an alternative economic system that exists in the world today, North and South Korea. We didn't want to repeat too much in this video, but it would be a great follow-up watch that you should be able to click to on your screen now. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.